friends, my name is Katie. Welcome back to my channel, Life Between Words. I have my May wrap up for you today, and I know I'm bringing it to you a few days late, but oh my gosh, I've just been so tired the past few days. I haven't been able to do anything but nap myself when Fox is napping. But anyway, here I am to talk about the books that I read in the month of May. So let's get started. This month I read five full length novels plus a short story, plus a graphic novel, plus I finished a book from last month, and now I'm almost completed with another novel. Um, I'll probably finish it today. So all in all, I read almost nine things, which is really, really pretty good for me. But keep in mind, the short story was like two pages. It was a really short story. So the first thing I read, I actually finished up from last month, and that is Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. Assassin's Apprentice is the first book in the Farseer trilogy. In the Farseer trilogy, we follow our main character, Fitz. In this first book, he's a little boy. And we learn in the story that he is the bastard son of the future king. Once it comes to light that his father, Chivalry, had an illegitimate son, he abdicates the throne, which upsets a lot of people. And because of that, Fitz, the little boy, is despised by almost everyone. But there are a few people who he's not despised by. This first book is really a coming of age story about Fitz as he navigates the world and his place in it. He is apprenticed to become the king's assassin. And so he's taken under the wing by a character named Chade. He also has a surrogate father named Burke who takes care of him and loves him, but distantly. There's also a larger plot going on that you know will carry over into the next books, but I'm not gonna say much about that because at this point, not a whole lot is known. But just know that this was an excellent first installment. I loved this book so much, it's probably one of my favorite reads from this year so far. I found Robin Hobb's writing to be very literary in nature. It wasn't very beautiful, it was very straightforward, but it was very, very well crafted. I thought the world building was great, and I especially thought the characters, especially that of Fitz, was so fleshed out. This was definitely a character-driven fantasy novel, which was perfect for me because I love character-driven stories. But I'm also very particular about that because I don't want the plot to be sacrificed and the plot in this book is so rich and detailed I found it so compelling and I'm really really excited to pick up the next book. The next book I read was called Baba Yaga's Assistant. It's actually a middle grade graphic novel. This graphic novel is kind of a reimagining of a Russian folktale about a witch named Baba Yaga. I got it from the library so I don't have a copy and I can't show you any of the illustrations but I found the story very charming. For a middle grade novel about kind of a scary witch, I found it just the perfect amount of sinister without being over the top, and Baba Yaga definitely has motives that go deeper than the surface. The book is about a young girl who feels like she doesn't really fit in into her family. Her mother and her grandmother, who were the two women in her life, who really, really understood her, have passed away, and she's left with her father, who she feels doesn't really understand her. She runs away from home to go and find and live with Baba Yaga, and the story kind of takes off from there. So I am a big fan of middle grade, but I feel like even if you are a little hesitant to pick up a middle grade book, this graphic novel was still spooky and poignant enough to grab adult readers, and I thought it was a great place to start for having never read a graphic novel before. The next thing I read this month was a very, very short, short story by Ray Bradbury, who wrote Fahrenheit 451, I believe. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that's the novel he's most known for, which I actually haven't read. This is a short story he wrote called All Summer in a Day. This short story is about a future in which Venus has been colonized. In this world, Venus is very, very rainy. It rains all day, every day, for years and years on end. Our main character, Margot, a nine-year-old girl, moved from Earth to Venus when she was four years old. But because Margot remembers Earth, she also remembers remembers sunshine, although all the other children that she's in school with on Venus grew up on Venus, so they've never seen the sun. This story begins on a day in which the sun is going to come out on Venus for an hour, and Margot has been living for this day. That is all I'm going to say about the premise of this little short story. You can find it on the internet. I highly recommend it. You just go and pick it up. It's a really quick read. It took me about 15 minutes to get through the whole thing, and it was fabulous. I was amazed that Ray Bradbury was able to pull out the kind of emotion that he did 
in the really short space that he gave himself to write this story. I mean, it really was just like two to four pages. It was very short. It was brilliant and heartbreaking and so, so beautifully written and so, so sad. But it was so worth my time to read. But also really powerful. Powerful because it's the story of the cruelty of children in some ways and the power of the sun and sunshine and what a pull that can be. I feel like it explored so many different themes and topics in such a short amount of time. I really found this short story very powerful. I heard about it on Ann Bogle's podcast, What Should I Read Next? And I know I've talked about Ann Bogle before. She is a blogger at The Modern Mrs. Darcy. She was talking about this short story and she encouraged the person she was talking to to read it and I was like, I'm gonna read that because it's really short and I had just put down another book. I just decided to pick it up and I'm really glad that I did. After that, I picked up The Goose Girl by Shannon Hale. This is a retelling of the Grimm's fairy tale, The Goose Girl, so it keeps the same name and it's a very, very faithful retelling. I went back after I read the book to read the original fairy tale and you know, all the major plot points are the same, it's just Shannon Hale has created a much richer, deeper world with m much more fleshed out characters. I loved the way Shannon Hale told this story. I found the writing beautiful and the romance sweet and the, the characters, especially the female characters, really strong. I just thought it was great. I loved every second of it. It's about a princess named Ani who's been betrothed to a prince in another kingdom. On her way traveling there, her entourage turns against her and one of her handmaidens decides to usurp her. And so Ani is displaced. And the story takes off from there. Like I said, the writing is fantastic. The story is so well told and the characters are very fleshed out and Ani, although she finds herself in a position of weakness, is not a weak person and I loved her and I really loved her friendship with Enna, who we meet in the book as well. After that I finished the book Not a Drop to Drink by Mindy McGinnis. Uh, this book I read on my Kindle, so I don't have a physical copy, but I'll put a picture right here. This book has come highly recommended by Trina from Between Chapters for as long as I've been watching BookTube. It's a post-apocalyptic book that takes place in a world where water is scarce. At the start of the book, we meet our main character, Lynn, and her mother, who live in a house right by a pond of fresh water. And they have to protect that water from all of these people that are tr that are also trying to survive. Her mother especially lives without much sympathy for anyone else who's not Lynn, her daughter. For Lynn, her mother is the only person who she's ever known, and the only person who's ever taught her about the world. So because her mother is a hard, unsympathetic person, Lynn has also grown up to be a hard, unsympathetic person, until the unthinkable happens and she finds herself on her own. She's been raised without the instilled value of compassion and kindness, and she's as hard and as prickly as the physical world around her. And then all at once, things change, and she has to learn to adapt. So that's the premise of the book. This book is about learning to love in an uncertain world. And I don't mean romantic love, I just mean love love for people, love for humankind. It's about learning to hope when there's nothing to hope for. It's about learning to offer compassion even when you might not get any compassion in return. And finally, it's about letting people in even when it seems like there's no one you can trust. This is a book where not a whole lot happens, but it's so rich in character development that you don't miss the action. And there is action, it does come, but it's like there's little pockets along the way. After I put the book down, I kept thinking that it felt a lot like a Western. Now, like I've said before, I haven't read a lot of Westerns, but from what I know of the genre, this book at least was sparse and brutal and untamed both in content and in tone. And I thought Mindy McGinnis did a beautiful job of matching the language to the feel of the book. I was really, really happy that I read it, and I know this book has a companion that I probably will pick up at some point. I'd like to anyway, but who knows when that'll happen. Then I did a buddy read with my new good friend Hope Ortego. She has a channel here of the same name, and I'll link that down below. Together we read I'll Give You the Sun by Jandy Nelson, and I, I really enjoyed this book. I'm not going to gush about it like a lot of people will. And I think one of the reasons I enjoyed this book was because I just really enjoyed reading it with Hope. We had such a great time talking about the book every night and, you know, talking about other things too. I think that that contributed to my enjoyment of the book. This book is about a brother and sister relationship and you alternately get the perspectives 
from the brother Noah and the sister Jude. Shortly into the book you realize that along the way in between these two tellings of their life, something has happened to rip these twins apart and they aren't as close as they once were. I enjoyed Jude, the sister's voice, more than I enjoyed Noah's voice, although I loved both of the characters. And the book explores a lot of things that I think teenagers can relate to, you know, first love and dealing with tragedy and dealing just with growing up and figuring out who you are and who you want to be and what your passions are in the world. Towards the end of the book, Jude says something like, all was grace. I'm not sure if that's the exact line, but it's something like that. And I feel like that's really what this book is about. It's about grace. It's about forgiveness. It's about discovering the sometimes horrible truth about something that someone did and offering them forgiveness anyway. And that is grace, right? So that's what this book is about. So I really liked the way those things were handled. One of my complaints was this. This book was really well written, but I didn't love the writing style. And I think this is just a personal preference. I found the writing to be very clever. And I, I don't know if you know what I mean when I say that. I think there's a difference between beautiful writing and clever writing. I didn't find this writing beautiful, but I found it very clever. And sometimes I think clever writing ends up annoying me a little bit. It feels kind of pretentious and I don't like that feeling very much. So I think that's really what ended up bothering me about this book and why I couldn't give it a full five stars. Although I did enjoy the story that it told and I did enjoy the characters and I loved reading it with hope. So those are just some of my thoughts about the book. Next I read Voices in the Ocean by Susan Casey, which I got from the library also and I had to return it. So I don't have a copy of it anymore, but I'll put a picture of it right here. And in fact, I'll put the picture of the cover that I got and then I'll also put a picture of the English edition of the book because I think it's a lot prettier than the edition that I read, but uh, either way the words inside are the same. I did a full review of Voices in the Ocean, so I highly recommend that you check that out. You'll get a lot more of my in-depth thoughts about the book. This book changed me. I don't know in what ways it changed me entirely. I'm still thinking about the book a lot and the impact that it had on me. The book revolves around toothed dolphins and whales, like orcas, which are the biggest, and then I don't know what the smallest are called, but you know, like bottlenose and spinners, which are in Hawaii. It does go into some of the science and biology of dolphins. You do learn a lot about the dolphin brain and dolphin intelligence, but the book is also a lot about human interaction with dolphins, whether that's good interaction, because throughout history we do have a lot of instances where humans and dolphins have got along beautifully, and then we also have a lot of instances where particularly humans are very, very cruel to these creatures of the sea. It made me think a lot about my own place in the world, and just in general, the cruelty and injustice of man. It was a really difficult read, but it was really, really good. Yeah, if you want to know more of my thoughts, please check out my review. I go into a lot more detail about what the book made me think about, and my thoughts in general, and what the book is about, and I highly recommend you check out that review because I would like more people to read this book. I just found it so fabulous. And then, as some of you may know, I'm rereading Harry Potter, and this month I reread The Goblet of Fire, and I loved it so much. I would say this isn't my favorite Harry Potter book, but I've been telling a lot of people that saying I like one Harry Potter book less than another is like saying I like cookie dough ice cream less than chocolate chip ice cream or something like that. I love both of them. I love all ice creams. I love all Harry Potters. And then finally, I'm almost done with The Dream Thieves by Maggie Stiefvater. I have less than 100 pages. This book started off really slow for me. I had a hard time really wanting to pick it up, and because of that, I think I'm going to put off reading the third book until next month. Not because I don't like it, just because I just feel like I need a little bit of a break. Um, I really am enjoying this, especially the last 200 pages really picked up and things are, things are cracking now. So I'm looking forward to see how this ends, but I'm not going to say too much since this is a sequel and I don't want to give a whole lot away, but I am really enjoying it and I am excited to pick up the third, even if I do decide to wait. Whew, so that was my wrap up. That was a lot to talk about, so hopefully this isn't going to be too long, but I'm kind of afraid it's going to be really long. I'm so sorry, but I'm so glad that you stuck with me and 
Please let me know what some of your favorite books that you read this month were. I think my favorite book, well, definitely Assassin's Apprentice, and can I say Harry Potter even though that's a reread? I'm going to say Harry Potter even though that was a reread. And of course, Voices in the Ocean. But Voices in the Ocean was so hard for me that I, it's hard for me to say it was a favorite. It was definitely life-changing, but was it a favorite? I don't I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, thanks so much for dropping by today, and I will talk to you next time. Bye!